So good evening, good morning, and uh, welcome to uh, this uh, first initiative of Journal of Hand and Microsurgery, uh, the Association of uh, Indian Orthopedic Association, Orthopedic Association of South Indian States, Tamil Nadu Orthopedic Association, and Trichy Ortho Club had made an initiative uh, to have a monthly series of journal club. Uh, to start with, uh, we have uh, chosen the topic of distal ladies fractures. Uh, it's always really, you know, fascinating for every orthopedic surgeon, especially hand surgeons, to deal with. Uh, with this brief introduction, uh, I'll welcome uh, all the uh, faculties, the uh, pioneer of uh, the hand surgery, and also one of the uh, well-renowned hand surgeon across the world, uh, Dr. Jesse Jupiter, uh, uh, Dr. Neil Chen, whom I know him very close uh, when I was there for a. Uh, short period of traveling fellowship. He's a nice gentleman, very good surgeon. Uh, Dr. Amir Adam, who's a you know, young and enthusiastic, valent uh, surgeon for all upper limb surgeries. And Burrito is supposed to join us. He's a very fascinating and wonderful uh, uh, surgeon. Um, uh, you, you ask him anything, he says, yes, uh, such a wonderful and a helpful person for me in all my endeavors. Welcome, Burrito. With this brief introduction, uh, the program goes uh, such a way, uh, we have a formal introduction by our Vice Pre President-elect, Dr. B. Shwashankar, who is there with us. A few words from our President of uh, Tamil Nadu Orthopedic Association, Dr. Thirumalai Swami. And then we'll directly go to the first talk with uh, Dr. Jesse, uh, followed by um, Dr. Neil Chen, uh, Dr. Borito, and then uh, Dr. Amir, who is supposed to be the last person uh, who can uh, know, mesmerize us with Valent. Uh, I request uh, Dr. Shoshanka to uh, start this uh, wonderful initiative and then give a few words. Thank you, Jiro. At the outset, I would like to welcome all the people who are on the panel now, especially Dr. Jesse Du Jupiter, Dr. Neil Chan, Dr. Goreto, Dr. Amir Hamad, all of them for this wonderful webinar initiated by hand surgery editor along with Indian Orthopedic Association, Association of Orthopedic Surgeons of South Indian States, Tamil Nadu Orthopedic Association and Tiruchi Orthopedic Club. I'm very glad that this is a monthly activity which they have started on this auspicious occasion of a full moon day. As you said, it's a month of light in India. We all celebrate with Deepavali. The whole month, Karthik month, we celebrate. And <coughs> on the mid, midst of this, on the day of full moon, we have got this initiative started by our own person. And I congratulate them. I welcome all of you for this wonderful meet. Wish you all the very best. Thank you, Dr. Shashankar. Uh, Dr. Thirumar Swami. Okay. Uh, we will go ahead with the first talk uh, by um, Dr. Jesse Jupiter. Okay. Uh... Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Jerome and uh, Terence, and I'm glad this is a, a very important beginning of what should be a, a great uh, a monthly program, uh, and particularly reaching out all throughout uh, Asia and Asia Pacific. Let me see if I can shed some light, given the Festival of Light, on what I think are some problem fractures at the distal radius. Since we're all treating most of these surgically that are intraarticular and are displaced, uh, the trend has gone, as you know, toward a volar approach and a volar fixation. Uh, the question is, is, in some cases, the reduction of the anterior or volar component is generally straightforward, but how do we approach uh, the dorsal lunate facet and uh, without making a second dorsal incision? Uh, and that's what I'd like to do to start out with. 
uh, we'll look at how do we assess the uh, relationship of the uh, dorsal lunate facet and its particular alignment. Uh, look at some of the issues from anterior fixation. Uh, is there any new technology that helps? And the adjuvant use of a uh, compression clamp. If you look at many of the outcome studies, uh, rarely are we look, looking at the post-operative view of the reduction. And as you know, it's generally very difficult to tell without an oblique view or a, certainly a CT scan. But there are a number of ways that have been published to give a definition as to the alignment and the uh, both in the coronal and sagittal projection, as well as the relationship of the ulnar head to the sigmoid notch. And bear in mind that an injury that involves the lunate facet of the distal radius is not only involving the articular surface of the distal radius, but also the articular surface of the sigmoid notch and distal radial ulnar joint. Not too long ago, uh, a multi-centered study tried to look at uh, the characterization of the dorsal ulna corner uh, using CT and then three-dimensional uh, recreation of the fracture. And this just gives you uh, an impression that the frag fragments are not always the same size or shape and uh, may be uh, more difficult in some cases to fix through an anatomically shaped plate. If we look at this and ask the question, uh, what's the ideal screw length in stabilizing a distal radius fracture from the volar approach? And what's the ideal plate position? Can we do both of these without putting our plate too distal in a position that may injure uh, flexor tendons? For a long time, many people have believed that for an extra articular fracture, for sure, you don't have to grab the opposite cortex. In fact, these are not functioning as screws, but they're really as fixed angle devices. And so if you have at least three quarters of the surface of the end of the metaphysis, uh, that should be sufficient. And with the extra articular fractures, it's really not as much a problem. And we can put the anatomically shaped plate in a very anatomic position and, uh, and avoid uh, some of the uh, problems of uh, screws. But there have been several studies uh, uh, that have looked at what happens and how to measure where the plate is. And keep this in mind, because when you assess your fixation, uh, want to look at the relationship of the plate to the volar cortex of the radius and how the end of the plate sits in relationship to that. And secondly, um, can we keep our plate in a safe position and then still get some purchase in the dorsal lunate facet? So we, we know that this works very well for extra articular fractures, but can we do the same with a uh, dorsal ulna corner displacement. So if we look at this, and the only way to be honest that you can really assess post-operatively is with a CT scan. And we've done that in a number of studies to look at this particular issue. So here you see uh, that where the plate is, it's pretty distal and uh, it, with a fixed angle device, this is where the screw will go. Uh, we can drop the plate back, but we may ha not have the flexibility of positioning the screws. But with a variable angle type device, we can avoid uh, that problem. And uh, here's a, the plate in a more anatomic position and in a better position for getting some purchase of the device. So if we have a plate that's too distal, we stand the risk of uh, causing flexor tendon injury. Uh, and therefore, 
ideally, we want to keep our plate more proximally, yet still try to get some purchase in that facet. As illustrated in this case, and if you look at the post-op coronal CT scan, you see that we've gone to but not through the dorsal cortex with a good functional result. Now, as we have looked at these in three-dimensional projection preoperatively, we've come to appreciate, as that multi-center study did, that there are multiple shapes. And therefore, it may be difficult to, to grab these with um, uh, your implant, but the best option is to avoid keeping the plate too distal, as illustrated in these uh, pictures on your left. Again, the protruding plate is uh, something that may be difficult with fixed angle because it may also put the screw into the joint. And we'd rather have the plate more proximally. And if we have variable angle technology, we can accommodate that as illustrated in this uh, clinical case. Here's another clinical case. So we, I don't know the answer as to the ideal screw length in an extra articular fracture, but if a large dorsal cort cortical component exists and is displaced, more purchase in that is better and, uh, and more predictable. Now there are some new technologies that have incorporated a way to uh, incorporate a dorsal small percutaneous positioning of a screw into uh, the recess uh, hole of the uh, volar cortex. I've not used this and uh, don't have experience with it, but uh, some uh, people have published on this and it may be satisfactory. Bear in mind that the cortex of the dorsal lunate facet is very thin so you have to have a, at least one washer to prevent it from going into the bone. But this is from their study showing a very nice uh, reposition and fixation. Now there are a number of ways otherwise to do this. And let's look at the use of a compression clamp because um, by getting uh, the volar plate in position and then having an aid to help reduce that uh, dorsal facet, we may be able to avoid making a second incision dorsally. So this was a prospective study looking at 61 consecutive patients, all treated in Uruguay uh, uh, and evaluated by uh, our service as well. A standard volar approach, standard manipulation of the fracture on the volar side applying the plate in an anatomically safe position, but then using a reduction clamp to aid in compressing the dorsal lunate facet component. One of the advantages of this clamp is that we don't have to keep the wrist in a bent position when we're reducing the fracture. We can keep it in a more neutral position, apply the plate, fix the plate proximally, and then uh, use this clamp, which is a ball tip clamp with the green uh, illustrated component is radio opaque plastic. And it sits on the dorsal surface over and wraps around the ulnar head. And the idea being that by compressing, we can bring the fracture fragments together a little bit more uh, reliably and then apply uh, our screws uh, in a fixed position, in a safe position. Here's the case. And one thing that the clamp also can do is help reduce the volar tilt. So if we look here, we have um, the volar side is fairly readily reduced because it's often not comminuted. Uh, and now we've reduced it and Here's your, your reduction through a standard vol approach. And now the plate has been applied, uh, held in place by one screw and one clamp. And then uh, this is the um, ball tip clamp that was used to compress the fracture. 
Here you see it before compression. And notice mm -hmm. by squeezing down on the dorsal surface, uh, we're able to improve the uh, volar tilt. And here's that patient postoperatively. So in this study, we use the pre-op and early post-op axial and sagittal CT scans and, uh, and looked at this. And if you look toward your left, the pre-op uh, data on this one patient and the post-op data, I think you can appreciate the realignment of both the uh, coronal and sagittal uh, views of the sigmoid notch and the ulnar head. Here's another patient with a displacement and the reduction. And here's yet another patient in the study uh, with both um, uh, sigmoid notch displacement, dorsal lunate facet displacement. And um, in a sagittal view, you can see the uh, amount of dorsal angulation of the metaphyseal component. And this is the post-op CT scan. Notice the screw will go up to, but not through the cortex. And if you look at that case from pre-op to post-op, the uh, improvement is substantial. We now look at the, the uh, studies uh, of the average age and uh, type of fracture and the objective and subjective evaluation. And um, let me uh, say that this is a, a good study because it shows the alignment uh, post-operatively and um, gives you an idea of the uh, clamp that, uh, impact on the reduction. So I think that that's um, something that uh, it's the supplier of this is Dupuy uh, Synthes and it's, um, it's a useful device to have uh, when you have complex articular fractures. So with that, um, my 15 minutes is up and uh, I think we'll turn it over to Dr. Chen. Thank, thank you. Good. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jesse. That was a wonderful uh, talk. It was nice to hear from directly from you, uh, though on a digital platform, uh, this uh, moments I'll cherish for a long time because I wanted to meet you, see you. Uh, thanks to uh, Terence, Joseph, Jerome for uh, giving this opportunity for me. I request uh, on behalf of uh, the whole team to give a memento, a virtual memento too. It's a drawing of yours. Uh, I request uh, Terence to hand over that memento to you, please. Hey, thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> this, this was a picture you know, we drew uh, one of our... That's great. That's great. <laughs> yeah. At least I have hair. Yeah, <laughs> so we will send this uh, caricature uh, yeah. with uh, properly made with wood and to your address, and also okay. we'll send it through your email so that you can have it in the email. Thanks, thanks. Okay, for thank you. Great. Well, um, let me extend uh, my thanks again to Terence for inviting me. Um, and uh, let me share my screen with you to start. Okay. Okay. So um, just some disclosures to start with. Um, and where I wanted to begin um, was to take one step back and give us a sense of uh, what do we understand? And then I think we can start um, coming back to where Dr. Jupiter has brought us in terms of the importance of um, paying attention to these anatomic factors. Um, this is the data and I wanted to start off with this picture because the data is cloudy and the ways we can see and understand our outcomes of distal radius fractures really is through this lens. And I think that if we 
begin with our understanding that we don't see that well, I think that's a good place to start. We know that fractures are heterogeneous. We know at, from our own clinical experience that a subset of fractures do well regardless of the intervention and a subset do well with uh, some type of intervention. But our outcome measures are, are quite crude and we know that they're altered and impacted by overall health, society, and psychology. When we start looking at the data and then looking at the highest quality studies that we have available, we can see that the data is conflicting. When we looked at volar locked plating versus non-operative treatment, uh, we have two conflicting studies, one that says there's no difference in the DASH PR, PRWE, whereas another study shows that those outcomes are, are superior in volar locked plating. When we look at comparisons to external fixation, we see that outcomes are similar long-term, but volar plating has a faster recovery as we would expect intuitively. And then when we compare volar plating versus CRPP, we continue to see some of these problems. We see that um, the outcomes are relatively similar at five years, but we do see some signal in the data that grip strength and radiographic parameters are superior in locked plating. And we sit, see that same trend in the comparisons between volar locked plating and non-operative treatment. So in our interpretation of this data, we can see that outcome measures are crude and they're affected by psychosocial factors. Kevin Chung did a very large trial in multi -center, multiple centers across the United States. And what did he see? He saw education was really the major determinant of outcomes and the treatment type and the radiographic parameters weren't associated with it. So how do we interpret this? And this gets challenging. And I think that we have to interpret it as, okay, our ways of looking at this are limited, but there's a signal that we can see that anatomic parameters appear to make a difference. And so as we begin to think about this and try to put this information into a context, we can say ulna positivity, disorders of the radiocarpal axis, large articular step-offs, all of those are meaningful and impact outcomes at some level, but not at this large broad level that we're seeing with a DASH or with a, a PRWE or a Michigan hand questionnaire. So if you're going to operate on a distal radius fracture, your goals are to restore radiographic parameters as best as possible. And this gets us back to where Dr. Jupiter was at our prior presentation, is that there's value to anatomic reduction. So um, building on the concepts that Dr. Jupiter has given us, I'm gonna introduce a couple other concepts here. And some of the evolving concepts are about carpal instability and articular malalignment and radiolar convergence. Some of the problems with articular step-off, Dr. Jupiter had this, had this uh, seminal paper looking at articular step-off and the effects of it. And he observed that a step off of two millimeters was associated with arthrosis, but a more important and more uh, valuable uh, takeaway point was in further papers that he had written in clarification of this, in that all patients in the series develop some level of radiographic arthrosis. And that, that's an important takeaway point. This, the two millimeter cutoff was just the cutoff to reach that statistical threshold, but all those patients were having changes. And when you look at the, the papers that have followed subsequently, especially by uh, Catalano and Goldfarb, you can see this, radio, this arthrosis progressing over the course of the, ne the next couple decades. You see that at seven years, at 15 years, this arthrosis is progressing, and you see some of the consequences of um, those earlier malreductions. So our understanding is that this step off has a relationship, but it may take a while to manifest clinically in most of the cases. So when we look back, when we say our outcome measures, we, we have this focus on DASH, on PROMISE, on PRWE. 
these instruments, and this is work that was done by David Ring and Dr. Jupiter as well, is that those instruments are overwhelmed by depression, they're overwhelmed by anxiety, as, as Kevin Chung was demonstrating, they're overwhelmed by education. But that central question of does quality of surgery matter, does reduction of surgery matter, it's, it does matter. And it's just that our instruments are, are crude, I can't see it. So here we're at our point, can we improve reductions? When you look at the, the clamp that Dr. Jupiter shown, that's one technological improvement. There's other advancements that are happening as well. There's new locking technologies. Current locking plate technologies involve cross-threading of your screws. Cross-threading of your screws into the plate. And you can cross-thread the screws into the plate um, a couple times, but then you lose the locking capability. Um, and this, this is uh, variable angle technology is a really major improvement because it allows you to place your plate different locations and still get angles that allow you to capture different fragments. But there are new technologies that are similar to uh, pedicle screws in the, uh, in the dis being applied to distal radius as well. And so uh, when you use these technologies, you can improve your reductions. This is an example of uh, doing using a joystick technique. So you've applied your plate proximally, and let's say that you've secured your radial styloid in the position that you want it, but you see that the ulnar corner, the ulnar form, uh, portion of the fracture isn't ideal. You can lever this using your compression screw and then lock it, hold it in place with a K wire and then lock it in place with the locking cap. So there are new ways of doing this and this is all coming down the pike. This is all, um, these developments are coming over time. And I, I would expect many manufacturers having similar technology soon. And our goals are to continue to improve that articular step off, continuing to improve the articular reduction. A second concept is the concept of radial ulnar convergence. And Scott Wolf and uh, Trahan, as well as George Orbe, have uh, really written a fair amount about this over the last five years. And you can see here on the picture on the, on the left side, you can see that you have this convergence of the radius towards the ulna. And commonly, this has been interpreted when, when you are doing these surgeries as well, my distal portion of the radius is translated radially. But in fact, it's that convergence of the, the radius to the ulna, the forearm bones are coming together. That is the actual pathology. And some of this is perceived as translation. Some of this is actually perceived as loss of height. So one of the takeaway points that um, Trahan has really given us is this idea of trying to reduce that or trying to fix that convergence. And the reasons why are that portion of the interosseous ligament uh, is at the wrong tension when those two bones converge. And when you restore that alignment, you can restore that uh, form relationship and improve the mechanics of the forearm. So I wanna go over a sample case here and we can also discuss some of the applications of um, newer technology here as well. This is an uh, interarticular distal radius fracture that's dorsally displaced. You can see that the radiocarpal axis is uh, disordered. Um, you can see that, uh, that this, this is likely to improve with an operative intervention. We can look at the CT scan. We can see this. there's some articular displacement. You can see some uh, disorders of the uh, radial carpal axis. And on this view, you can see that part of the joint is uh, impacted inside the, inside the um, shaft. So there are different ways of approaching this problem. You can apply the plate proximally first, applying the plate to the shaft and then bring the fragments to the plate. Another way of approaching this is distal first, applying the plate distal to, to the distal fragment and then reducing it to the distal fragment and then bringing the shaft to it distally. I think uh, when Terence was visiting, we had done a case using this uh, distal first approach. And so it, in this distal first approach, there are some, uh, some advantages. 
and using all these other concepts, let's, let's bring them together and apply them. So you apply the plate distally, you're trying to match it to that uh, articular surface on the ulnar side. And then these compression screws can pull together the fragment. And by pulling together a fragment, you can capture the rotation, lock the rotation. Secondly, you can try to address the uh, interarticular malalignment by using K wires to rotate your radial fragments to bring them to the ulnar fragment. So you're you're trying to get the you're trying to in, to minimize your articular step off, to minimize the articular pathology. And then again, by placing the screws into that radial styloid fragment and locking the screws in place, you can get uh, more controlled capture. Then using uh, this method that Dr. Jupiter described long ago is that you can basically lever the plate back onto the shaft. And then from here, you can address your radial, your, uh, radial ulnar convergence. And you can see that uh, this, there's a screw hole that allows for uh, moving the plate, moving the shaft relative to the plate. And by using a laminar spreader, you can reduce and you can improve your reduction. So let's, I'll show this in, um, again, these are our steps, fixing the ulnar corner distally with compression screws, the locking caps, reducing the radial styloid to that fragment, and then reducing the entire uh, distal fragment to the shaft. Um, here's another case example. Here, I'm capturing that ulnar corner. I'm only paying attention to the ulnar corner. I'm ignoring everything else. Um, and then, once I have the ulnar corner, the I corner, use I this key wire to joystick, to joystick the uh, radial styloid into position. And then from here, I then take that construct, apply it to the shaft by clamping this down. The locking mechanism is very strong in this situation, in this construct. And so you're not as worried about pulling out the plate, um, pulling the plate off the distal fragments. Here, we place the screw in this spinning hole, this oval hole that rotates, and then we're correcting the radial ulnar convergence. And then uh, once that's done, we place some locking screws proximally. So um, those are the many different, there's many different techniques of uh, treating distal radius fractures. And it's the evolution of these techniques to try to improve our anatomic reduction. Um, I think that this is continuing to be an evolution. Now the complications, a, a couple complications to be aware of, um, and I believe that uh, are critical to be um, uh, thoughtful about. The first is the volar lunate facet, and the second is the watershed line. Volar lunate facet, this is a problem that Dr. Jupiter described along with uh, Diego Fernandez, uh, Keith Raskin, and um, in Neil Harness, you can see that there was this loss of fixation of volar lunate facet fragments in the setting of volar plating of distal radius fractures. And so when you're looking at these fractures, you have to pay attention to the size of that fragment and be aware that if you're not capturing that fragment, the fracture can jump the plate, the, the, the carpus can jump the plate. And so when you're looking at these different problems, know your options, know that you can capture it with a plate. Sometimes you might have to play, put the plate a little bit more distally to capture it. Uh, you have to know options of uh, different pin plates, uh, pins that you can capture. There's many different additions to plates now to try to avoid this complication. And then the third option is tension banding. This is another technique that was described by Dr. Jupiter as well. So this is the fragment specific plating. You can see that there's little paper clips that are held down to the plates. This can help uh, capture those fragments. And then here's another uh, case. You can see on the CT scan, there is a very, very small volar lunate facet fragment. And uh, any way of capturing that with the plate is, is very difficult. You can't even capture it with those pins. So what do you do? You can do a tension band. You place two holes in the radial shaft approximately, place a free needle with a 25 gauge wire, on the needle and, and use that to pass it through those shaft holes and then pass this in a figure eight configuration to draw that fragment down and, and hold it and secure it. And you can see here in this X fix and pins, you can see that construct working right here to secure that fragment, to hold that fragment in place. This is after it's healed. Um, and so 
know all those different techniques. And then finally, there's this concept of this flexor tendon irritation with the watershed line. And we look at the margin of the distal radius. There's a, a level that you have to be respectful of when you see this plate application. And once you pass that watershed line, you may be beginning to irritate the flexor pollicis longus. And a general uh, rule of thumb is that that distal border of the peroneal quadratus to avoid placement of your plate distal to that. But th this uh, was originally de described occurring in one plate, but there's many plates where this, uh, this problem occurs. And I think the most important takeaway point is actually to be very mindful of this crepitus uh, after uh, in, in late follow-up. Okay. Um, we looked at our own series of flexor tendon, flexor pollicis longus re ruptures requiring reconstruction at MGH and Brigham Women's Hospital in our, our larger system. And the important point that we saw was this was all of those ruptures were occurring in patients with soon grade one plate placements. So these were proximal plate placements, but they were still getting FPL ruptures. So why was that happening? Well, we speculate that the plates that were placed more distally were being taken out. People were paying attention to crepitus. People were paying attention to the distal plate placement. But patients with the more proximal plate placements were still having problems with flexor tendon ruptures. So we're, we're following our patients with distal radius volar plates very carefully to make sure that they are aware of crepitus, that we uh, think about uh, testing for this at six months, at one year after surgery, just to avoid this complication because the outcomes of the FPL reconstructions are very inconsistent and we wanna minimize that, that complication. So in conclusion, um, long-term patient rate outcomes are overpowered by other factors. And if you understand that, it helps put the, some of this uh, data into context. Short-term recovery is better in general with volar lock plating. Grip strength may be related to reduction of anatomic parameters and um, maybe a, a good surrogate for understanding the outcomes uh, while we still, you still are using these uh, crude outcome measures. And finally, it's, we've known this for a long time, but arthritis is related to intraarticular malreduction. So our takeaway points, there's a role for better anatomic reduction. If you're going to do the surgery, do it as well as you can, but do it in, and be aware of all these other pitfalls, including loss of fixation of the volume of facet, be aware of FPL rupture. Thank you again for having me. Um, and then uh, <coughs> I, I really enjoyed uh, speaking to all of you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Nilchen. I still remember that uh, the Miami plate which you, which uh, I was there uh, during your time, and you mentioned about the alignment on the ulnar aspect of the disability. That's more, you know, uh, the critical, you know, putting the fixation. That's great. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Trimble Chami here, our uh, Tamil Nadu State Orthopedic Association president, to have a few words. Hi. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Terence, uh, for the wonderful uh, meeting on the forecast uh, distal radial fracture, which we all see commonly, but uh, we have gained a lot during these two talks with uh, the master, uh, Dr. Jesse Jupiter, and a very clear presentation by Dr. Neil Chen. Uh, really, we are very thankful to both of you. And uh, on behalf of the Tamil Nadu State Orthopedic Association, we convey our regards to both of you, as well as all the panelists as well. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, kindly accept a small uh, E uh, memento from us. Uh, uh, thanks. <laughs> That's great. Well, and that will be sent to you physically in due course of time. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to the next speaker, Dr. George Borito. Well, thank you so much, Terence. I I share my screen. <clears throat> uh, let me see if you if you see my screen. Yeah, perfect. Okay, perfect. Well, uh, thank you so much for your kind invitation. Uh, it's a it's a great pleasure to be uh, with all those uh, in, in, with all the participants. Um, and thank you. It's, it's a it's a it's a pleasure for me. Well, 
Uh, I'm talking about dorsal plating for distal radius, and the goal of treatment in unstable distal radius fractures are to restore metaphyseal alignment as well as to avoid intraarticular incongruence. Unstable fractures require internal fixation to obtain these goals. However, there is no strong evidence that bowler plating be, uh, be better over dorsal plating. In late 90s, the dorsal approach and plate fixation gained popularity because of direct articular visualization and placement of internal fixation as a dorsal buttress, allowing adequately reconstruction of the articular surface. Although this later approach has several advantages, the rate of associate complication rapidly discredits the dorsal plating. In 2002, Orbay and Fernandez introduced the principle of polar fixation for dorsally displaced fracture with locking plates. Since then, polar approach has gained great acceptance, leading to a change in treatment over the years in favor of the word bolar plating. Bolar locking plate have provided capability to repair both simple and complex fracture while avoiding the hardware related complication associated with dorsal plating, as you can see in this young man with an intraarticular distal radial fracture treat with a bolar locking plate and his functional result at two years follow up. Nonetheless, the use of volar plate has been also associated with a substantial rate of complication. <clears throat> and this complication can be divided in those related to technical mistakes and those related to inability to fix or even to maintain the fixation of some fracture patterns. While the complication of the extensor and flexor tender are associated mainly with technical mistakes, loss of reduction has been associated to the fracture pattern. In this paper, the author concludes that bolar locking plate can be used for most of these radius fracture, as we know. However, certain commute fracture type may be treated best by alternative means. With respect to dorsal plating, its indications have no follow any rational criteria. Most of the studies describe the treatment of articular fracture as a main indication for dorsal plating. However, articular fractures have many different patterns and some fracture threats cannot be treated by volar or dorsal plating contrary to what many authors have concluded. Lasky uh, state that certain fracture patterns are more ap appropriately stabilized with dorsal plate fixation. They conclude, they, sorry, they include shear, dorsal shear fracture, type Barton, Barton type fracture, die punch fracture, or fracture pattern in which an indirect reduction from the volar approach cannot be obtained. Although the first two patterns are well defined, the third one is more back. Even more, Lasky did not report the result of dorsal plating in this pattern since he described the indication in a technical article. In our hospital, we have defined the fracture pat pattern to treat by dorsal fixation after reviewing the first 60 cases of dorsal plating we did. After a cri critical analysis, we have defined that most fracture could have been treated by volar plate but there were some fracture patterns that were amenable to, treat it, to treatment by dorsal approach. Those fracture patterns we defined to treat by dorsal plating were displaced central articular fragment, bolar distal fracture, displaced dorsal ulnar fragment, dorsal partial fracture, or a, combina or a combination of these patterns. Here you can see uh, an X-ray and a CT scan of the displaced central articular fragment. We have included also uh, a pattern bolar distal fracture, and we have quantified the minimal distance between the fracture and the radiocarpal joint in our cases with a mean of 4.7 millimeter. Our findings, of course, do not pertain 
to the bolar lunar fracture, as Dr. Uh, Dr. Dr. Chen uh, showed us, which absolutely must be fixed by a bolar approach, as Dr. Jupiter has learned us. Here you can see a uh, displaced dorsal lunar frac fragment. And uh, in this uh, in these figures, you can you can see a dorsal partial fracture, which we define uh, as a amenable to uh, fixation by dorsal uh, approach. So this, so this type of fracture pattern determine the indication for dorsal fixation of the distal radio in our institution, and we have recently reviewed the result of these cases. During a six-year period, 679 distal radio fractures were treated with open reduction and internal fixation in our institution. Of these, 32 patients underwent dorsal plating of the distal radios. Five were excluded for different reasons, and the remaining 27 patients fulfilled the inclusion criteria. The mean age of the uh, at the time of treatment was 55 years and 63% of patients were women. X-ray and CT scan evaluation showed that all fractures had dorsal displacement and all but five cases had a combination of the fracture pattern described before. According to the AO, AO classification, one case uh, of type A2 fracture, A were type B groups one or two, and 18 were type C groups one, two, or three. At the median follow-up of 34 months, the median score of the DASH questionnaire was four, and the median score of the PRWE was three. 26 patients had no pain or rest, and 15 patients had no pain during activities. The patient rate the function of their risk with a median of nine over 10 points. All these, all the articular parameters were restored to normal values, as well as articular gaps and steps, and no patients suffered loss of reduction during the follow-up. However, 12 patients have a plate removal at the median follow-up of six months. None of them had extensor tendon rupture. I will present two cases as example. The first one is a 39 years old man with an intraarticular distal radius fracture. CT, uh, CT scan show a volar distal fracture of the radius and a displaced dorsal, dorsal ulnar fracture. Open reduction and internal fixation with the dorsal plate was performed. At six months, the plate was removed and at three years follow-up, he has good recovery in terms of function, pain, and subjective outcomes. The second one is a case about a 47 years old woman who suffered a distal radio, a distal ulnar fracture, again a dorsal ulnar fragment, and a bolar distal fracture were observed on CT scan. In this case, a dorsal plating with a columnar technique was performed with no loss of red reduction during the follow-up. And at four year follow-up, she had good functional recovery. In summary, indication for dorsal plating have no follow any rational criteria in the literature. Most of the studies describe the treatment of articular fracture as a main indication for dorsal plating. Although most of these injuries can be treated with bolar locking plates, there are almost 5% of these fractures with a specific uh, pattern that are amenable to treatment with dorsal fixation, with no case suffering a loss of reduction. These specific fractures are, once again, displaced central articular fragment, bolar distal fra fracture, displaced dorsal ulnar fragment, dorsal partial fractures, or what is more common, a combination of this pattern. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for such a nice presentation. And uh, we have, um, have a moment for you.
दिस विल बी गिवन यू फिजिकली टेरेंस इट्स वेरी नाइस थैंक यू सो मच वाह इट्स अमेजिंग थैंक यू सो मच एंड थैंक यू फॉर जॉइनिंग अस थैंक यू वेरी मच थैंक यू थैंक यू फॉर योर इनविटेशन थैंक यू थैंक यू टेरेंस नेक्स्ट स्पीकर डॉक्टर अनिल uh <clears throat> it's a pleasure to invite uh, dr adam uh, who's from uh, uh he's he's a consultant orthopedic hand surgeon from prince uh, court medical center from national university of malaysia care and he'll be speaking on uh, his technique of valen for uh, distal radius fracture fixation dr amar yeah, thank you so much prof okay um let me share my screen Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Terence, for having me here. It's my pleasure to share um, our technique on Wallan for distal radius fracture. Um, so, for plating distal radius, um, distal radius fracture fixation is usually done under general anesthesia or regional anesthesia with tourniquet. So, for this, we normally need anesthesia anesthetist to be around, and also uh, using a tourniquet to reduce the bleeding at the fracture site. So um, our problem previously, uh, when we started this in 2017, was uh, we had limited OT time, um, uh, up to until two to three weeks for our closed disc radius fracture. So we explored the option of do, using Wallan technique to um, reduce uh, to do our surgery under local anesthesia, and this is also an option given to patients who are contraindicated for regional anesthesia or general anesthesia, such as patients with, with uh, Uh, multiple comorbids, and so how do we improve this? This is uh, that's why Walan came into the picture. So for our lecture outline, um, I will introduce what is Walan, and how do I prepare my Walan solution, and I will tell, I will discuss and how long um, is our solution last uh, for the duration of the surgery, and then we'll go into the Walan for the radius and the lesson learned. Full disclosure: um, We have a website. Our website is uh, Walan Dot Surgery. It's free for everyone. You just need to be registered, and we make no money from this website. Um, and this is a book by Donald Lalon, which is uh, um, our basically our textbook for Walan surgeries. And this is uh, the co-founders, Don Lalon and Eli Phillips, um, and also the other editors from all over the world. Uh, practicing uh, Walan surgery in their own uh, hospitals. So what is Walan? Walan stands for wide awake, local anesthesia, which we use lignocaine or lidocaine, and we don't use any tourniquet to secure the bleeding. You can read more about Walan in this paper by Lalon, uh, conceptual origins, current practice, and views of wide awake hand surgery, published in 2017. And in this paper, he exp- um, there is a rapid worldwide adoption of this technique from all over the world, even in India by Raja Sabapati and Abdul Khan. So, how do I prepare our Walan solution? So, we started off, started off with um, our 100 mils of normal saline, and we took out 50 mils of that, and we put in 50 mils of lignocaine, two percent. So in our sensor, we don't have one percent solution. So we use the lignocaine two percent and dilute it together with 50 mils of normal saline, and that will become 100 mils of lignocaine two percent. Sorry, one percent. And to secure the hemostasis, we don't use any tourniquet. So we use adrenaline. So one in one thousand, and mix together all everything into this uh, sol- solution, it become one in hundred thousand. And to reduce the injection pain and have the prolonged lignocaine effect, we mix uh, sodium bicarb in one in ten. So this is a hundred mils. We put ten mils, the whole um, ampule inside the solution that we have. So all this will become hundred in eleven mils of Wallan solution. And how much to give? In a normal page, uh, in a normal lignocaine one percent, the max dose that we can give is actually four milligram per kilos. But if we add adrenaline to the mix, we can give maximum dose of seven milligram per kilogram. So in a healthy seventy kilogram patient, 
the maximum is 70 times 7. You can give about 490 milligram. And since 10 milligram lignocaine is equivalent to one mil, a total of 49 mils of Wallam solution can be given in a 70 kilogram patient. And how long does it last? A paper done by my teachers, actually, Prof. Jamari Sapwan and Prof. Shalima Abdullah, they did a study on randomized control trial of trigger finger release under Wallan and without adrenaline. So they compared between our, the lignocaine plus adrenaline and without adrenaline. They found out that if without adrenaline, the average, uh, uh, average time they can last is about two hours. But if you add adrenaline into the mixture, it can last about 6.8, 6 hours. So about six to seven hours. Let's go direct to our uh, topic now, distillate the structure. How do I inject my solution? So there is two things that you need to um, give, which is the subcutaneous injection, and second is the periosteal injection. So for the first subcutaneous injection, I will give at the incision site. So this is your normal modified Henry's approach on the FCR. 10 mils of solution will be given on uh, underneath the skin here at number one. Number two will be at the proximal aspect deep to the parotium. Three at the middle aspect, and distal aspect for the fourth. So um, for the personal injection, um, we need to give, for, for me, normally I will give at the most superficial part of the bone, which is our lateral, part, lateral aspect. So this is where we give the first two mils on the directly on the bone at the lateral aspect. Then we walk the bone and give it at the volar and also distal aspect, about four mils each. So this will cover approximately circumferentially around the bone. Then we give middle part of the bone and then distal. So this will cover surrounding the whole distal radius. This is a video showing our injection technique. Using the 27 gauge needle and this video is speed up eight times. So this is where we inject at the perosteum. As you notice, initially I gave two mils first at the uh, lateral aspect. Then I walk the bone at the dorsal and volar. So this will cover the distal radius. But in some patients who is um, in who have big big hands, so you might have to give more at the dorsal distal radial anal junction. So we give at the dorsal aspect here about 10 mils there. And for those who have concurrent ulnar standard pressure, even though you're not planning to fix it, you just give it there because when you do manipulation to reduce the fracture, patient might have pain if you don't give coverage there. So this is just to numb the ulnar standard if you have a fracture there. If you don't have, don't bother to give it there. So this is the distribution. The blue is actually where the subcutaneous layer are, and the red dots here are the incision site. The pink are the periosteal um, coverage after giving the lignocaine. So as you can see here in one of our cases, we show that there is a clear surgical field here, and that's the fracture site. And this is without using tourniquet. So even without using tourniquet, it doesn't uh, disturb your surgical field. And this is a, uh, our patient also showing that before and after, showing the blood, the surgical field again, patients moving freely without any pain. All right. This is after reduction, showing clearly the plate is there without any bleeding. And the patient is smiling, happy during the surgery. And Another thing to note that there is also no intraoperative swelling during closure. Good reduction there. So we published our surgical technique uh, in Journal of Hand Surgery in 2018. And since then, there are a few other surgeons that have published their own technique on doing plating disarrays under wide awake technique. And our series were just published in October 2020, um, Walan radius versus General Anesthesia. So this is um, under Global Online, so it's freely available um, to read. 
this is another case that we did a 70 plus year old lady who is with multiple comorbids and um, dependent on wheelchair. So she insisted that she doesn't want any um, general anesthesia to be given. She wanted to go back immediately after surgery. She don't want to be admitted and she don't want any cast. So the only option for her is obviously this um, plating under wide awake surgery. Okay, now Auntie, can you move your hand? Gerak tangan. Macam ni? Very good. Tak sakit lah Auntie? Ha. Semua posong ni very good kan? Tak, tak sakit pusing macam ni. Bagus Auntie. Very good. Okay, thank you. And this is her after two weeks ah, of surgery. Atas bawah. Very good. Another, another lady here um, insisted on Walan surgery because she had very bad post op nausea and vomiting and she doesn't want that again. So we did her under Walan. Again, no bleeding, not much bleeding there. It's quite clear surgical field. And after two weeks, range of movement is nearly full. Finger extension, flexion, wrist extension and flexion are all good. So this is uh, our friend, good friend Thomas Apart from France, who, who also um, practiced this technique in his, uh, uh, his hospital and also Paul Sibley from America. Quite happy doing this because um, for those patients who, are, who has very bad comorbids. And this is a, an example of a patient who is on warfarin and the pulmonologist expected her to be admitted to ICU for two days after general anesthesia. Since he is practicing uh, Walan surgery there, so he did this under, under Walan and um, he, she, the patient was discharged on the same day. Now. And this is Ruben Duken from France also doing um, this radius under Walan. So this technique is actually, there are a few surgeons that um, successfully implemented, implemented this technique in their own practice. And then come COVID-19 um, in March 11, 2020. And this um, puts Walan surgery in the highlight uh, where British Orthopedic Association have come up with a guideline where they aim for to perform all hand and wrist surgery on the local anesthetic block or under Walan. So because of that, um, I was invited by Dr. Lalonde and um, Jeff Gelfan from Annapolis um, invited us to give a talk on our technique so they can start their own uh, Walan service there in the hospital because the, the anesthetists are busy treating their COVID patients. So on April 7, we did uh, a half an hour it's supposed to be half an hour Zoom meeting becomes about three hours where we share our own uh, techniques so, so they can um, redo it in their own center. And <coughs> immediately after, maybe about two, three days after that, they had a case where they did their own disorders under Walla. So this is a video showing his technique and his um, success uh, case. Okay. Second case. It's quite a big segment, a uh, big fracture yeah, there. Okay. So about, there you go. Turn your swarm. Palm, palm up, palm down. Take your hand all the way up. How are you going? Doing good. Any problem or not? No. I don't have with you on. So what are lessons learned? Walan can be applied for fracture fixation or other bony procedures. Walan is very useful, especially in this current pandemic. And bony Walan is easy to do as proved by Jeff Gelfan. After a Zoom meeting for three hours, they successfully implement this technique there in their own center. So before we, uh, before I um, end my topic, um, I would like to share this uh, disability Sorry, not, not radius, radius, it's radius and ulna plating. For a patient who had a bilateral hemothorax where 
they had to put a chest tube on him and he can't lie down um, uh, on flat on the bed because of the um, he can't breathe well with that. So we had to do the surgery um, with him sitting down. So he was comfortable throughout the surgery. And we did both the radius and ulna plating for him. Okay. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Anil Adam, for uh, sharing your knowledge on volant technique. Hope uh, many of the delegates will start following this technique soon. <laughs> I take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Terence and uh, the organizing team of Journal of Hand and Microsurgery for this wonderful initiative. Kindly accept their uh, digital memento on behalf of the organizing team. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> Very nice. We have a lot of questions from the panelists and the delegates, so we can take quick questions pertinent to all the four speakers. Terence, can I go ahead? Please, please go ahead. Uh, thanks, Terence. Uh, Dr. Jesse Jupiter, uh, my question was uh, uh, with the dorsal fragment there, uh, we were still talking about screws uh, and with the clamp now, which you showed, uh, is there a, any other alternative, even the alternative which you showed as a compression screw uh, system, which is common, uh, still, as you said, the dorsal, the cortex is still thin there and with the compression there with this, the screw can still uh, protrude later on. So are we looking at any other alternatives like making that clamp a uh, cannulated kind of a thing and passing uh, fiber wires or something like that to catch that dorsal fragment. Uh, totally totally eliminate the screw itself. Yeah, haven't done that, but it's a it's a very intriguing idea. Uh, yes, you're right. Um, to try to get the screw uh, close to the cortex and then use the clamp, uh, it's likely to push the screw through the cortex. It's just a it's just an a, adjunct to better reduction per se. It doesn't necessarily guarantee that the fragment will be stable in that position. Uh, and therefore, I think if your CAT scan shows a fairly large fragment, it's worth trying to uh, at least support a screw in uh, that way. And you can uh, use the screw in an over drill position to try to get a little compression as Dr. Uh, Chen showed with his plate. Thank you. So, uh, may I ask Dr. Jesse Jupiter, sir, regarding the uh, use of interoperative CT scan, as the spine people sometimes are using that for particular screw, uh, is it uh, a possibility in this radius <coughs> also? Uh, the CT scan, uh, Interoperative. In, well, I think uh, when you talk to colleagues who say, uh, I've done so many, I don't need a CT scan. Uh, I think uh, the economics of the CT scan are become less and less a problem. And it certainly gives you better information, uh, gives me better information preoperatively. Thank you. The unmute yourself. Sir. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if a patient has a distal radial ulnar joint dislocation along with the comminuted uh, distal radial fracture, how will you stabilize that in acute cases? Well, actually, uh, we just looked at a series of those where there's. Um, Definitely a, uh, a dislocation beyond 
just displacement of the fracture of the distal radial ulnar joint. And um, uh, if you can get the sigmoid notch restored, what happens is the stability of the distal radial ulnar joint comes primarily from the contact pressure between the ulnar head and a sigmoid notch. And that's why if you want to test for stability after you've fixed the end of the radius, uh, we often used to take the ulna and go up and down, but it will always go up and down more than the other side because the distal radial ulna joint ligaments have been torn. But if you compress the ulna to the radius and then rotate after you've fixed the radius, if, if you'll see that it's almost always stable unless the distal band of the oblique ligament has been disrupted. So I think that when you have this distal radial dislocation uh, and you can reduce the radius, it will almost always reduce the ulna unless there's an interposition of tendon or some other structure. Uh, now, if you have a large styloid fracture in that setting of the ulna, um, it, it might be a good idea to fix that. But otherwise, it's the contact pressure that keeps it stable. Okay, another question to Dr. Jupiter as well. Uh, if the distal ulna is too much comminuted and it's not fixable, and what, how will you deal that case? If it's too much combination of distal ulna, very unstable distal radial fracture as well. Well, uh, it depends on the patient and the patient's um, activity level, but if it's not reconstructable, uh, I, and an older patient, who I suspect we would consider a DARAC with a tendon stabilization. I wouldn't personally put an implant in, in the setting of instability, unless you had a total joint implant, which ordinarily you don't have when you're doing trauma. Please go ahead, unmute yourselves. Uh, this is for Dr. Chen. Uh, I have two questions. <clears throat> when, we, when we reduce the distal radius, our uh, reference points basically for the height and inclination would be we are looking at the DRUJ as such. Now, if you have the DRUJ convergence, uh, what is your reference points for you to say that you've restored it at the end of the surgery? Yeah, you're still looking at the you're, you're still looking at the height and those traditional parameters, but you're also looking at the contour of that, the radial edge of the radius, and to see that that is relatively aligned um, with the radial shaft. If you see that line discontinuous, uh, you have to study it and just make sure that, that, that you've been able to restore that relationship. Um, you'd like to see that the ulnar side is restored and the radial side is restored to, to give you a sense of what, um, what, uh, the, what, whether the bones are together. You can over distract um, using a laminar spreader. So you have to be a little bit careful with that as well. And my other question was with your uh, Zoom grade one plates now, you said you're following them up. Are you using an ultrasound or is it clinical examination? What is it for you to say that FPL is undergoing attrition? Is there any pinocinovitis or any early signs of you know impending ruptures? So what is the follow-up? How, how does it happen? Yeah, at six months, I'll check the crepitus. I'll put my fingers on the on the FPL and have them, I'll check crepitus at that point. If I feel any crepitus, the plate comes out. Um, I think that uh, the the lessons that I've learned from that are, are that you have to be more wary. The second issue around it is that um, with, with regards to ultrasound, Duretta, Duret, Duretti Fufa has been looking at that um, and she, at, at hospitals for special surgery using ultrasound. Her results are very interesting and you can get very good resolution with ultrasound. Um, the question ultimately becomes, uh, is, does that add anything to your clinical exam? You know, if you're seeing uh, Frank, if you feel Frank crepitus, I think that's a pretty good threshold. And then the question is that, are there other gradations that you have to, um, 
intervene on earlier. Uh, I, may I make a point? Uh, when we were talking about reduction and um, the uh, height and alignment, um, you know, uh, what Margaret McQueen's group years ago looked at over 4,000 distal radius fractures treated non-surgically. And what they found was uh, patients tolerated uh, reasonably well malalignment as long as the intercarpal alignment between the lunate and capitate was within a reasonable uh, sense of alignment. So what we see really uh, in a lot of patients that have had trouble in motion or stiffness or uh, even late arthritis is a, uh, a, a carpal malalignment issue. And I think that's, that's one way uh, you might judge if you're treating somebody non-surgically, uh, you know, whether they're perfectly reduced in the volar tilt or not, 10 degrees, 20 degrees, it's really where the lunate sits in relationship to the capitate that will be the most important outcome measure. And that's what, it's interesting, that was defined a number of years ago, but in these studies that looked at non-op versus op, they, they failed to do that. And, um, and certainly that's why grip strength uh, may be a, a relative uh, valuable uh, parameter. And also I'd like to add to that, in addition, as you're doing your surgery, and this is what I learned from, from Jesse as a fellow, is that when you see that alignment and you, volar, you place your volar plate and you see that the uh, capital lunate radial axis is off, that's when you know you have to go to the back. That's when you know that you have to add that adjunctive fixation. So. Thank you. Okay, one question to all speaker. What is the role of K-wire, only K-wire as a fixation in this era of plating? Probably we can well, start with Burrito because uh, uh, Vijay is the one who is into uh, intrafocal fracture reductions for dorsal well, radius fracture. So he uh, categorically wants to know the role of intrafocal kapanji wiring in uh, distal radius, preferably dorsally displaced radius. Burrito can start with uh, Yes, yes. Um, well, uh, I think that is an option. Uh, in, our, in our hospital, uh, there are so many years we don't use just uh, intrafocal pinning. So uh, uh, with advantages of the volar locking plate or internal fixation, either dorsal or even volar, uh, we don't use uh, any more uh, just intrafocal fixation. But it's an, it's an option. Uh, um, you have to... to to, to, you have to have a clear uh, knowledge of the complication of, uh, of, uh, of uh, intrafocal fixation and also of the instability you can have with uh, intrafocal fixation. But uh, I, I think that it, 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 it rests as, a, as, as, a, as an option today. Our partner, you Chai Mudgal. Have... Oh, oh, go ahead, Jesse. No, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, our partner Chai Mudgal um, has done a number of does a number of uh, patients using K wires, and his outcomes have been great. I think that uh, what's important is that he selects the patients very carefully, um, and he, you know, he he has a lot of experience uh, and an understanding who's going to do well and who you have to be more careful with with using pinning, and so I think that. I think there there can be a role, but the experience needs to be there. What were you going to say, Jesse? I'm sorry. Oh, well, I I think um, we we need to understand why um, the volar plating for Collie's type fractures became important, and that is, it's really when you're dealing with metaphyseal bone that's deficient. Uh, traditional methods, casting, or even K wires were not as predictable, but even if they were working with X-Fix or 
uh, cast and someone was older and it was their dominant limb and they lived alone, it was a big imposition. And what we saw when we treated those as was shown in all these talks with internal fixation, the person could become more independent. So really the lock plate was e evolved for uh, osteopenic bone in, in metaphyseal areas. We've expanded it quite a bit, but really um, you can do many two and three part articular fractures with K wires very well. And, uh, and it holds very well. But if you look at when we introduce X fix to, to stabilize uh, that, uh, it's not as easily tolerated by older patients. And um, it takes longer for them to regain their function, uh, functional action and strength, but they do regain it as well. So it, that, that's what uh, we've come to realize why in certain groups that that you can treat with one versus the other, as was uh, Dr. Chen said of our partner, he selects the ones um, one way or another. And for the same fracture, he might put a volar plate because he needs that patient to be more independent early. Yeah, I tend to agree with Dr. Jupiter. As, as shown on my patients before, uh, there is uh, the 70 year old lady. She was moving her fingers, um, her radius, after about two weeks, she's doing everything by herself. So early results are very, very good with molar plating. Yeah, but if there's a logistic is the problem, then everywhere. Yeah, uh, we understand that Vijay, you know, uh, and economically, you know, uh, less uh, constrained, we do have uh, problems. So we have on the panel, uh, Anirban and uh, Atahir, a quick comments on that to the panelists so that we can wind up. Uh. Uh, one question I had for uh... Uh, Anirban, can you repeat the question? Uh, we are not audible. Okay, we, we, we are not audible, so we will take questions from uh, quick from Tahir. Hello, uh, my question is to Dr. Neil Chan. Uh, regarding the technique that uh, you have demonstrated was very nice technique. Either we can do a uh, distal first technique or the proximal first technique regarding the locking plate. So what's your preference, what you do and how many percent of the patient you will do distal first and how many patients you will do a proximal first? Yeah, what so I'm doing more and more distal first. I would say right now I, I probably do about 80% of them distal first. If I have a volar, so if I have a volar Bartons, I'll do proximal first because it, it makes a lot more sense to get, to place the plate down and then push everything up. So it, it also is dependent on the fracture. Um, but if I can do the distal first, I will um, because I feel like my reductions uh, are, I, I have, I'm more happy with my reductions because I can get the tilt better because mm -hmm. I've locked it in with the plate and um, then I can adjust for the radial convergence uh, secondarily. So I don't have to worry about the plate placement as much. Thank you. And how often do you do a fragment specific fixation? Um, I do it occasionally. And it, it really is, I'm really looking at that volar ulnar corner fragment and seeing if I can get fixation on that corner. If I can't get fixation on that corner uh, satisfactorily, then I will um, do uh, fragment specific plating. Um, I will say I probably do it less now than I did, you know, four years ago, five years ago, because of just the evolution of um, implants. Thank you, Dr. Chen. We'll have one last question from Anirban. Uh, sorry, again, we couldn't get you on the uh, audio. Uh, audio is not playing well. Could you type that so that we can ask the panelists? Uh, before that, a uh, quick 30 seconds from all the speakers and then pro probably we'll end it. Quick 30 seconds. We'll start from Dr. Jesse. Closing remarks. It, in, in summary, uh, I think what we're seeing is that it's not a, uh, a stagnant uh, uh, area of, of 
treatment. There's constant evolution. We're seeing evolution uh, with anesthet anesthetic control. We see evolution of implant fixation. And we see evolution of um, better understanding of fracture patterns that you might uh, do just as well with a secondary dorsal approach from viral approach. So actually, um, many people thought, you know, hey, it's not, a, not much to these fractures. But in fact, uh, there's quite a bit more than uh, a simple Collie's fracture. Thank you, Dr. Jesse. Dil Chen, your quick uh, 30 seconds uh, uh, closing remarks. I think that, uh, as Dr. Schuper mentioned, it's in evolution, but, and, and also I would add to that, our understanding continues to improve. And um, our understanding as it improves will begin to clarify many of these areas where uh, we don't fully understand or have a, a clear vision of what's happening. So uh, I look forward to our, our evolution over the next, you know, uh, next uh, century. <laughs> well said, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Dr. Burrito, a quick uh, closing comment. Yes, well, uh, as uh, you said already, um, uh, digital radio fracture, we, we have to understand the principle of treatment of digital radio fracture. Um, after understanding this principle, we have uh, some different ways to, to achieve that, uh, that principle. And uh, evolution of implant and evolution of uh, techniques, as uh, uh, Amir showed us, uh, uh, should, should, should allow us to better treat our patients. Uh, that, that's, the final, that's the final concept. All the evolution should allow us to treat better our patients. Thank you, thank you, well said. Uh, Dr. Amir, your closing comments. Yeah, I would like to answer a little bit of questions here in the q &A section. So there's a one from Hort Sulchit. Uh, what's the difference between Walan and brachial plexus block? So one of the things that uh, under Walan is we can uh, we reduce the bleeding by do, giving adrenaline without any tonic A. While if you do a brachial plexus block, obviously you need tonic A to reduce the bleeding. And second question by Talib Al-Harabi, in regards to Walan, do you think this will aggravate the already swelling area? I don't think so, because uh, we just want to uh, numb the area. And like I said, um, how many meals total we can give is uh, according to the patient's weight. Um, Chantas was asking whether um, this radio fracture during the MSK's manner. It depends on the hospital. In our hospital, before this, it was done under... Hospital setting is not ambulatory, but with this, we can push it towards ambulatory case um, setting. Um, most in Ali, I didn't affect the digit. I'm not worried about the digit so much because this is giving it at the wrist, so it doesn't really affect the digit. digit. Um, is there any difference in one setting for distal radius fixation or this patient? Um, the only difference that I would like to add is actually to give local at the distal radio anal joint because sometimes the, the solution given at the parasol region from the radial styloid area doesn't go all the way to the distal radio anal joint. So that can cause pain if you don't numb the area. Um, I think last one. Yeah, um, uh, don't you have afraid to damage the sensitive nerve during wallet injection? So um, again, if we give directly uh, deep to the uh, parotium from the lateral aspect, the radial aspect, there is nothing there. There's no nerves, no arteries there. And you have to walk the bone slowly. Go to the dorsal and go to the volar. Walk the bone. If you, the needle is always on top of the bone, you are safe. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. We have to leave you here because uh, we are short of time and uh, we have a uh, no, very uh, strict agenda that will finish in one hour. Probably we have extended it. Uh, we are extremely sorry for that. We could not take a lot of questions. We will be on time uh, with all the programs. Uh, with a brief uh, you know, uh, introduction, we have a, a lot of uh, delegates from Iran, Iraq, Philippines, all those are uh, giving us congratulations and wishes to all the speakers, panelists here. Uh, with quick 10 seconds, uh, uh, I'm just going to share the next program so that probably everybody will be you know, aware of what's happening in the next month series. So we'll be happy to share that. We'll have a series of talk uh, in the upcoming DRUJ and TFCC injury on the December 12th. Uh, keep uh, uh, your calendars uh, filled with it. 
uh, with this um, yeah yeah with this uh, uh, i like to thank all the uh, speakers and the panelists who are here who made us exactly the day uh, you know this ladies is still evolving we will have a lot more uh, an evolution to come thank you one and all good night have a safe day thank you bye bye you're welcome thank you so bye. much bye 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 good night everyone Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.